Good morning, everyone, or it might be afternoon or even evening for people who aren't on the continental U.S. Uh, welcome to the first Dharma talk for the year 2021. It's a tradition in Zen that on the new year you write uh, a poem. One poem is, or more than one poem, one poem is a death poem. So that if you die during that year, your death poem can be read at your funeral. And you have a picture taken so that that can be put on the altar as, at your funeral. Uh, and then you also traditionally write a poem to give to your teacher. So this was a poem that I sent to Shoto Harada Roshi. Humans call it a new year, but not the tiny tight buds of the plum tree, not the sparrows hopping among scattered seeds, not the raindrops sparkling in the night. And yet, calling it a new year helps us let go and begin anew. Which is the essence of our practice, letting go and beginning anew moment by moment. You know, this is a human invention. It's not the Chinese New Year. It's not the Jewish New Year. It's not the Mayan New Year. <laughs> but even though the New Year is a concept, invented by groups of humans, it can become skillful means in our human lives. Listening to the radio as I drove uh, down the road to the monastery this morning, I heard people describing, let's get rid of this horrible year of 2020. And we might be tempted to try to throw away all the things that we didn't like that happened in this horrible year of 2020, but we can't. It's impossible. It is the foundation for this year, for this day, for this moment. Just like we can't throw away aspects of traditional Zen practice just because we currently don't happen to like them. I've often described that my appreciation of service, the service, chanting services that we do three times a day, has, has fluctuated throughout my life of practice from uh, enjoyment, intense enjoyment, to, oh gosh, this is boring. It, do it doesn't matter you know, what the mind says about it. It has an underlying purpose. It, it has benefit to us, whether we know it in our conscious mind or not. It has benefit to others, whether we know it in our conscious awareness, whether it is told to us or not by someone. So just like we can't throw away aspects of traditional Zen practice carelessly just because we currently don't like them at this stage in our life, or we wouldn't throw away a child or a former partner ever. They're always in our life, no matter what kinds of difficulties we have. Our New Year's Eve ceremony included burning things that we didn't want to carry forward into the next year. So this is a, a wonderful tradition, I think, partly because we bring from semi-conscious mind into conscious mind uh, what we would like to practice with or without in the next year, what we would try to transform in the next year. So we think of, what do I want to get rid of? That's our mind's tendency. Let's look at the negative, and what do we want to get rid of? So, you know, every year, I don't know about other people, but every year mine's like the same. It has a few variations, but it's, I would like to not carry forward judgmental tendencies, gossiping, jealousies, etc. Or maybe we don't want to carry forward difficult experiences we had in life that periodically intrude into the life of this moment. Things that trigger difficult emotions and so on. But our human mind tends to concentrate on the negative, on 
what we might call the dangerous. In our practice, we see this happening. We see it happening in our meditation, in the spaciousness of meditation. And we acknowledge this tendency and the harm that it can cause if we do not develop a foundation of skillful thoughts and emotions to counteract the harmful thoughts and bring in the medicine of positive emotions, positive thoughts, and eventually the most potent medicines, the medicine of don't know mind, and then spacious, illuminating mind, mind without boundaries. So it's useful to look at what were the blessings of this, quote, horrible year, the blessings that will continue to provide benefit in the future. I'm sure we can all think of some. I made a list of a few. One is vaccines that took nine months instead of eight years to develop. Another in my life is the ability to connect with people virtually. So I was motivated and able to see and talk and joke with my grandchildren much more than in past years when I had to take time off from work, make travel arrangements, fly there, etc. And I will continue to do that, to connect with them on a more regular basis after travel opens up. So maybe you felt that advantage and will continue that advantage of this year. And then, of course, in, within the Zen community of Oregon, this year opened up our ability to reach people across this continent, in Europe and in Africa and Latin America. So we have a much bigger sangha. We have this whole big fam sangha family now that uh, we didn't have before. And that's wonderful. It enriches our, our sangha so much. In the past, we've undertaken themes for each month of practice. And this month, our programs through Zen Community of Oregon will focus on vows. Usually we start, because people start the new year with vows, and often those vows disintegrate or deteriorate, um, it's helpful to work together to form vows. Vows uh, is a kind of strong word. It can be intimidating to some people, but um, the research is very clear that having a stated underlying purpose or purposes in your life uh, increases happiness, it increases mental health, it increases physical health, etc. So vows are a kind of internal promise. And the fabric of our life is actually woven of vows. When we begin to examine vows, we realize we've been making vows all of our life, many of them unconscious. It helps to bring them up to conscious awareness and look at the stream of the vows. In, the, in, the, in signing the vows books for people who are um, getting it for the course, I've been writing, I always write a kind of dedication in the books, and I've been writing, may the flowing stream of vows that is your life continue to bring benefit to you and to countless beings. The flowing stream of vows that is your life, we get to examine that when we stop and take a class on vows. Many of our vows are unconscious. Some of our vows are reactive. We watch what our parents do or our siblings do or somebody we don't like in the media does, and we make a vow, I will never do that. And reactive vows can be helpful or they can be overreactive vows. In studying vows, we will bring them up to a conscious level, into awareness, and in awareness is where we have choice. Do I continue with this undercurrent, this vow stream, or do I change it? It 
in underlying this theme of vows is something that Hogan talks about often, uh, a theme which I'll try to pick up as I do talks on vows. There is only one you. There will only ever be one you. In the whole of creation, there will only be one you. So what will you do with this one precious life? As singular as a daisy, as Mary Oliver says. Your singular and precious life. What will you do with it? I was... I've never liked the title that the publishing company picked for the Vows book. They picked it because they wanted it to cross genres. So the Vow-powered life, you know, might be... Executives might pick it up or something. I don't don't think that worked. (laughs) Um, I think we need to acknowledge that this is a a book about spiritual practice. And um, I'm always looking as I'm... And listening for the theme of vows as I listen to the news. Um, And I heard a program on uh, women who were incarcerated, who were leaving prison, and their concern was, where is my place now in life? Because they had been pulled out of what we call life, the stream of life, ordinary life, and they were wondering, as they went back, where do I find my place in life? And I thought, that's, a, that's actually a wonderful phrase for vows. Where do I now find my place in life? Vows aren't static. The word sounds static, like, oh, I made my marriage vows and I must keep them. Well, then I got divorced. People are worried, oh, I shouldn't make marriage vows because I got divorced and I broke my vows, so I shouldn't make any more vows because I'm going to break the inner critic comes in, right? But vows are static, they're dynamic, and you can continue to honor and cherish a person that you have divorced, maybe by not ever seeing them again. Um, there are ways, very ways, creative ways to honor and cherish someone, not to speak ill about them, and so on. Vows are dynamic, and they must change with our age and with our changing life circumstances. There are natural life transitions where it's helpful to look at our vows. So we have people come to the monastery after graduating from high school, after graduating from college, worried about taking that step out of the nest that's been provided for them so far, and making a wrong step and therefore ending up at the end of life in the wrong place, a place they didn't want to. Um, transitions like continuing, deciding whether to continue or end a relationship, um, having children, and then all of the changes in life that that, and life vows that that brings. Uh, leaving one occupation and trying to decide what to do next or retirement from a lifelong occupation, and then what to do next. Or then getting closer to the end of life. These are all times of life transition when it's very helpful to work consciously with vows. Like for me, I'm 75 and a half. And so, you know, I reckon I have maybe, hopefully, 10 more years of useful life. It could be less, could be more. but. Ten years is not very long. Uh, These days, the week, you know, it's like Sunday, Thursday, and Sunday again. It's like the week goes whizzing by in years also. So what to do with the remaining time in our life as we get closer to death? The monastery represents, of course, millions of vows. Millions of vows. So not just a current vow of someone to stay here and cook, which is vitally important, or stay here and work in the garden or maintain the grounds. Vitally important, but it represents vows stretching backwards through time all the way back to the Buddha's vow to find the source of suffering and then to find ways for people to alleviate that suffering for themselves. The 
the monastery represents the vows of the school district to build a new school for children and all the people who worked in this in this building, to, not only to build it, but to cook for the children and drive school buses and so on. This this monastery is is millions of vows, which we are benefiting from. And the monastery provides a place now for people to come and clear the confusion in their hearts or their minds and decide how to go forward. It provides a refuge for people, provides a lifeline for people. These are words that people have used. Not only the monastery, but Heart of Wisdom, of course. And then all of the programs that we're now beaming through space and time offer people a place of refuge, a lifeline, um, a place, a way to renew their spiritual life. There is only one you. In all of creation, there will be only one you. There's actually a website um, which is a very interesting website. It's find your twin. And you can post your picture on this website, and then, you know, through the magic of computers, they will scan all the pictures they have in their banks, and they will find your twin. And there's people studying these non-identical twins. There's a whole research project where they bring your twin from some other country, often, or part of the country, and then they photograph you, and then they do all kinds of psychological tests to study this phenomenon of an unknown twin. And of course, they're not twins, but they're amazingly alike. It's really, really interesting. So we always hope that somewhere we have a doppelganger or an identical twin. So if you want to go on that website, you can discover if you do. But there's still only one you. And even if there are other dimensions, like in string theory they say there are 11 other dimensions or 21 other dimensions in space-time or non-space-time, um, even if that's true, that person's not cannot be identical to you, to this one precious life. So I, I was remembering this um, when my mother died and I was grieving over her death and, and helping to take care of her possessions, you know, distribute or donate her possessions. Um, I found her in her apartment, her hairbrush with her hair in it. Of course, hair has roots and roots have DNA. And immediately my scientific mind went to, oh, and I, told, I confessed this to Hogan. I knew it was silly, but I, I had to say it. So I confessed it to Hogan. I said, you know, I have this, desire to see if we can clone her, because they clone dogs now. They clone pet people's pets. It costs a lot. But you can clone your pet who died, and you have your pet again as a little cute little puppy once again. So I said to Hogan, you know, I, I, I have this feeling like I'd like to clone my mother so I could have her again. And he pointed out, he said, you know, you couldn't reproduce all of the conditions of cause and effect all of the environmental factors that shaped her into the person she was. Like, you couldn't produce my grandmother, who was a single mother after my mother was age seven and went, lived through the, through the war, and the, the World War I and the Great Depression and bouts of, of, of OCD and depression and still went on to become a university professor. You cannot reproduce that whole life circumstance to create my mother again. Mm -hmm. So it was really just proof of your life is the only life. There is only one you now. So what can we do to develop ourselves this year? This is a very interesting investigation. I heard a piece this morning as I was driving in on NPR about the problem of lionfish destroying coral reefs. So not only is there climate change destroying coral reefs, but there is an, a, out, you know, a, a, an abundance now of lionfish who are who's scraping the rocks like rockfish. You know, they have a beak like parrotfish, and they scrape. 
the coral. And I only heard the end of the story, but um, it was about a man who developed a trap for a lionfish. Now there's a vow. And the trap is like a hula hoop with netting. And it's open like a clamshell. And in the bottom of the clamshell, they said he puts a piece of plastic somehow formed so it is irresistible to a lionfish. And then the lionfish go in, and the little clamshell closes, and then they trap them. So there's a life vow to create something that will be irresistible to lionfish so that you can save coral reefs. And then the other half of that is that apparently lionfish are delicious. So there's a whole market now developing for lionfish so people can enjoy eating them in order to save the coral reefs. So you see how one person's vow just spreads out. Thank goodness there are people who become lionfish trap makers. And thank goodness there are conservationists who are aware of this problem and can point that person towards that problem, solving that problem. And of course, everything is a temporary solution. Everything, no matter what we do, is a temporary solution. And we'll always have some kind of downside. So then there's incentive for the next people who come along to work on that problem, refine it more. Thank goodness there are people who are working on climate change. Thank, we saw a movie last night on Greta Thunberg. Thank goodness there's a Greta Thunberg. This young girl who has, just through her own dedication, and partly, you know, her autism is part of that because she's just like single-minded and so articulate and just so stubborn. She sat outside Parliament in Sweden and people began to pay attention. And in the movie, people just talk about how inspired they were by her, by her courage. And she just sheds that and says, you know, this, it's, we can all do that. We we'll all have to do this together. Thank goodness there are people who became epidemiologists. Epidemiologists are so surprised that people are interested in talking to them now. <laughs> They've worked in dusty labs their whole life. And suddenly they're important in the news media are calling them up and say, could we interview you on CNN? <laughs> Thank goodness there are people who spent decades working with viruses, but not just any virus, this very narrow field of coronaviruses. And then bat coronaviruses, of which there are hundreds. Thank goodness there are people who work making glass vials. And nasal swabs, there was a huge shortage of nasal swabs for a while, which is a reason we couldn't get tested, one reason. And then the little glass test tubes that you put the vial in, there was a sh shortage of, you put the little, little um, nasal swab in, there was a shortage of those too. Thank goodness there are people whose life vows include making those things, and ventilators, and syringes, and protective gear. Thank goodness there are people who picked working in hospitals, whether they're cleaning people who come in and sanitize the room, or people who sanitize instruments, or who became respiratory therapists, also a kind of sort of in the hospitals, like kind of a secondary occupation, you know, there's like the hierarchy, the doctors are the most important, and then the nurses are becoming much more important, but they used to be lackeys, and now, you know, that. Thank goodness there are people who chose respiratory therapy. Thank goodness there are an anesthesiologists who know how to intubate people. Or to how people who know how to thread a little line in your radial artery, me measure your oxygen saturation. That is not, I've done that. That is not easy to do. The, the, you know, the artery loves to just like spurt blood everywhere. So this is tricky to get in this little artery. Thank goodness there are physical therapists who help people who, who recover after long bouts of COVID in the hospital to restore their atrophied muscles. They can barely walk if they've been in there for months. Or thank goodness there are pharmacists. There was a pharmacist who, who does our rapid testing so that people can come into the monastery. Thank goodness there are pharmacies that have taken this on as a project and will give free free tests. 
you know, I, I, I grew up as a, as a pacifist from pacifist, pacifist parents, and I grew up in a very, I went to a very liberal college where we really looked, we didn't have National Guard programs, no. Like, we kind of looked down on people in the military, but thank goodness there are National Guardsmen and women who have been called in in this pandemic, who are fulfilling their vows as National Guards people to learn to administer rapid tests and have been called into hospitals because the hospital staff are sick and exhausted. And they just need bodies that they can train quickly to do something. Who are used to, yes, I'll do that, whatever it is. Thank goodness there are people who choose to live their lives through being ambulance drivers or funeral home directors or, can, or build crematoriums. Thank goodness there are people who want to be police officers. Like the story of this week of the police officer who decided not to arrest two women for shoplifting in a grocery store. They, were, they went through the electronic scanner but skipped the scanner and they were just trying to package up their groceries and leave. And he discovered in talking to them that they just needed food for their children. They wanted to have a holiday meal and so he spent $250 on his own credit card to buy them the food that they wanted to buy. Thank goodness there are police officers like that. And thank goodness there are people who want to reform the system of policing that has become warrior-like instead of life-preserving. Thank goodness there are people who want to be president. Do any of you want to be president? Think of that job. Thank goodness there's, there are people who want to be president even at age 78. Is that a job that we want? No. Is it necessary in this country, this democratic country? Yes. And every relationship teaches us what we want to do next or what we don't want, like the presidency or being a vice president or being a member of Congress. Our country's ability to move and change and move into a new era depends on people who want to do those jobs. Thank goodness there's a person who wants to be Shota Harada Roshi, whom we saw in his little New Year's greeting a couple of days ago, or Pema Chodron, or just fill in the blank. Thank goodness. There are people whose life vows carry them into those occupations. They didn't decide to become that. My uh, Shoto Harada Roshi, because he grew up in a temple, wanted to be anything but a priest. And he was all set to become a lawyer. And then he was on a bus and he saw Muman Roshi. And his, his life vow was catalyzed. His true life vow was catalyzed just by seeing Muman Roshi on a bus. Some of these professions we might look down on or not want our children to choose. And now we become grateful for them. The people who keep growing food, who keep on driving delivery trucks, who keep on checking us out in the grocery store and keep on wiping down that moving rubber conveyor belt that moves our groceries along, which I don't even know the name of that. Thank goodness. So if you would stop just for a moment Close your eyes and see who would you say thank goodness for, or what would you say thank goodness for? Thank goodness for. And if you can pick something that you previously never thought you were grateful for. Thank goodness for people whose life vows have carried them into doing this. And it can be wider than that, of course. In our practice, we differentiate between vow and means, vows and means. 
the means can always shift. So for example, someone who's working in a grocery store, the means is working in a grocery store. But their vow might be to send their child to college, save enough money to send their child to college. Or their vow might be to just feed their children every day. I don't know what their vow is. So the means can always shift. So for example, now I'm teaching less and writing more. But I'm also sewing more because the means shift with the times and the needs. I'm helping with sewing because I'm the most experienced sewer here, I think. And people who want to get ordained, and we will have some people get ordained in the next year, need help with their robes. So I'm now available to do that. Ten years ago, I wouldn't have been, or five years ago. And we had somebody else here who could help with sewing. So I can now help people sew their robes, robes that are a visible sign of vows. What you wear also demonstrates your vow. The monastery is a visible sign of come here when you need spiritual help. Even a picture of the monastery on our website. When you need spiritual renewal, when you need time out from your life to reset your inner compass. Sometimes I refer to vows as an inner compass. So if we start to kind of wander off, you know, and then we can look and see where is north. Where was I headed? So you don't start driving to Colorado and end up in Florida or an inner, an inner GPS system. And then, of course, taking the bodhisattva vow into consideration. What would you like to develop further? So, for example, I made a, a, a mini vow. You could call it a mini vow or means um, or a sub vow to do reading. I found that during COVID, my up till now, my ability to read became compromised. And I, I wrote to one of my friends who's my age too and teaches with me and said, does this happen to you that you just, it's hard to concentrate on a book? She wrote back, she said, OMG, this is really, really difficult. She said, I pick up a book, I read a page, and then I can't remember what I read. But fortunately, that seems to be resolving. So I took a vow to do some reading in two areas. One is in the area of, um, of Dharma, and specifically to read books by different um, Buddhist teachers. And I'm starting with Zen teachers, so this is uh, the Korean Zen master, Sun Sun Im, who is a good friend of my Zumi Roshis, and we, our sanghas did things together sometimes. And this book, Only Don't Know, the Teaching Letters of Zen Master Sun Sun, this was an inspiration to me very early on because there were so few books on Zen at the time. There were three pillars of Zen and Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, and then some more historical academic books. But this was very inspiring to me. So I'm reading it again because, you know, you, you, you discover new things when you read something after 40 years, 45 years. And then another category that I'm reading in is um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I got um, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man by Emmanuel Acho, who is an NFL player from Nigeria. And he says he feels like he's um, ideally placed because he grew up essentially in a white middle-class world um, and then entered the NFL. And then he says, I, he says, I'm ideally placed to understand both worlds. And he answers here the questions that people always ask him. So each chapter is something that people always come forward uh, with to talk about with him. Um, it's very, very, very well written and very interesting. And then this one I haven't opened yet, but I just got cast. It's a New York Times bestseller and a winner of the Pulitzer. She's won the Pulitzer Prize, Isabel Wil Wilkerson. And it's on cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. It was also Oprah's book club choice for 2020. So, 
So that's where I'm starting this new year. And I won't have time to read from both of those genres every day, but I'll go back and forth. So I encourage you, if you're interested in this topic of vows, to join uh, one of our classes, the groups that are focusing on vows this month, learn about uh, your life, your life as a flow of vows, your past vows, your current vows, your reactive vows, and to clarify your vows for your life, for the future, learn about the difference between means and vow. So for example, my desire or my vow, my mini vow to read from these books, that's the reflection of a larger vow. So what is that vow? So the times, I'll need help on this, but on Tuesdays, Kodos group is doing vows, Tuesday evenings. Hogan's on when? Saturday, Sunday, and Tuesday. Saturday, Sunday, and Tuesday evenings. And then I'm not sure about the Wednesday and Thursday groups, but we'll let you know. You can, but I know those, those two teachers specifically are focusing on vows. So please join them. And, and Sashin. And Sashin. Sashin this month will be all about clarifying vows. One of the prayers that I often make when I'm vowing to Jizo Bodhisattva is Jizo Bodhisattva. Um, king, queen of vows, please help us to clarify and accomplish our innermost vows. So that is my prayer for all of you too. Thank you.